Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of Z80 Dreams. This is part two of the AVC80 repair series. If you haven't seen the first part uh, where I tried to repair the keyboard and also gave some uh, stats about AVC80, you can find the first part in a link in the description below. But first, some corrections. So, in the original video I claimed that the ABC80 had 32 kilobyte of onboard RAM. That is, however, not true. It came with 16 kilobyte RAM of standard. Uh, you could expand it uh, via installing more memory, a memory card inside the computer, and then you can further extend it one more time with an external memory expansion. So all in all, it could come up to 32 kilobyte of RAM. I also claim that it had 24 kilobyte of ROM, which uh, also wasn't true. It came with uh, 16 kilobyte of ROM, which was mainly the basic interpreter and uh, characters. If you wanted extra functionality like uh, better interpreter or uh, peripherals, then you could uh, extend it via the ABC bus uh, and if you plugged in a floppy disk uh, you got a disk operating system as well so it could expand to a maximum of 24 kilobyte of ROM uh, the floppy disk uh, disk operating system being 4 kilobyte for example so uh, it had uh, less uh, RAM than I claimed initially and uh, it had a smaller ROM. However, it had a very good basic interpreter and it could do many more uh, advanced features uh, than many computers uh, of its time, which I will probably show in an upcoming episode uh, featuring the software side of the ABC80. Well, uh, that can compare to the TRS-80 with uh, initial 4 kilobyte of RAM, but it could be extended up to 48 kilobytes. So, uh, as a standard configuration, it had less RAM than ABC-80, but it could extend more, uh, you could get more RAM into it than the ABC-80. It came with 4 kilobyte of uh, ROM from 1977, which was basically uh, a basic interpreter but from the year after 78 and onwards it came as standard with 12 kilobyte of ROM so it probably came with a better interpreter or some other functionalities I don't really know the details of why it became bigger the Commodore PET likewise 4 kilobyte uh, RAM and could be extended all the way up to 96 kilobytes so it <laughs> you could extend it uh, to uh, have a lot of memory in it um, 18 kilobyte of ROM uh, now the Commodore PET was a bit special that it had two parts of the ROM if you want to say uh, it had a basic interpreter but it also had the so-called kernel and um, I heard some claim that the uh, interpreter was 8 kilobytes and the uh, uh, kernel was 8 kilobytes as well, so it's in total 16 kilobytes of ROM, but from the sources I find online it says that the lowest ROM, the Commodore PET hit was 18 kilobytes. So I don't know the relative size of the uh, interpreter and the kernel and well, some other functions, uh, characters and so on. but. It's worth to remember that it had two sides of the ROM. Uh, and it could be extended to 48 kilobyte in the later models. Uh, this is also from sources I found online. I don't have a pet myself, so I'm not really sure about these numbers. And you have to excuse me if, I, uh, <laughs> if I'm uh, mentioning the wrong numbers again. And of course the Apple II from the same time, uh, also 4 kilobyte of RAM. So, well, you can see that uh, at least in the standard configuration the ABC80 had uh, uh, more RAM than uh, the other computers, but all the other computers could be extended to have more RAM than the ABC80. So it depended on if you wanted to use the 
standard configuration or if you wanted to extend it um, yeah but basic configuration was uh, it had more uh, memory than the others um, yeah Apple II ROM <laughs> with a famous Vosmon uh, Vosniak monitor uh, was 8 kilobyte and it could be ex it was extended from 1979 onwards to 12 kilobyte and once again I don't know what this uh, change constituted of if they made the changes to the Wasmon or if they added new functionalities in it uh, I'm not sure so there you have it these are the corrections oh and I also talked about uh, CISC versus RISC uh, last time and uh, saying that the uh, 6502 was more uh, risk-like or that it was a risk uh, processor uh, however these terms uh, reduced instruction set computer and uh, complex uh, instruction set computer these terms didn't exist back in the 70s and 80s so you cannot say that the Z80 was this and the uh, uh, 6502 was that uh, however, they differed on how they made calculations and how many processes cycles it took to make a certain calculation. Um, so you can't really compare the megahertz speed in the way I did, but yeah, it's it's more tricky than that. Uh, however, from what I have learned is that the Z80 was pretty darn efficient. So that's all I can say. So that was all the correction I wanted to to tell you, and I'm very grateful for these corrections. Uh, uh, if you find any more errors in any of my videos, in this video, in the Amiga repair video, whatever, just tell me in the comments or uh, tell me in a private message. I'm very grateful to get the opportunity to learn what uh, errors I made and this, this is part of my process, this is why I make these videos, it's also to learn more. So please uh, correct me if I make any mistakes, I'm very grateful for that. And so without further ado, let's continue. So now that that is out of the way, uh, let's see how far I've got. So uh, in the last uh, episode I tried to make new uh, Keytronic foam pads from Mylar and foam but the foam that I got was not uh, stiff enough so it didn't work out. Then I got this letter with pre-made little foam pad pad pads. <laughs> so I got a pack of these little foam pads and as you can see there is this grey foam in between that compresses like this. And there are two adhesive sides, you just remove this yellow protection to get to the adhesive layer. And in the original plungers you need to reuse this little foil here. So you stick this foil to one of the adhesive sides and then there is a little plastic tab on the bottom that you stick on the other side. And the size is, I would say, the right size. They are a little bit thicker. I hope that doesn't become a problem. Uh, but from what I have seen, it shouldn't. Well, we'll see if it works out with these thicker ones or not. So, only an idiot would try to make their own pads. Uh, because it's so simple to just order a pack of these. But, since I am an idiot, I'm gonna try making them myself anyway. Uh, I'm gonna not make all of them anyway. I'm gonna use uh, these foam pads for the majority of the keys. But for some of them I just want to try if I can make my own or not. 
for the homemade solution I wanted to try, I got the same mylar as last time. And only one of the sides are conductive, uh, so I have to be careful with that. I got a much denser foam material than last time, so I hope this will work. And the same spray glue, hole punch, hammer, and of course a cup of coffee. So I'm going to start with uh, my homemade solution and try to make little circles. And if it fails, I will use the backup plan with the foam pads from eBay. So let's get to it. So I got my old trusty old multimeter out here and that is set in continuity mode and that is just to find out which side of the mylar is conductive. So one, uh, if you don't know what mylar is, one side of mylar is uh, aluminium foil and the other side is plastic to make it stronger. So let's see if I put it down here, nothing happens. But if I turn it, and this should be the conductive side. And yes, it's, it is. It's beeping, it means it, it has conductivity. So I'm going to mark this conductive side with a little X, just so I don't forget which side it is. Alright, let's hit it with some spray glue and put the foam on top. The X is here. So, by the way, why do I want to have the conductive side down? Well, because inside the keyboard, uh, the PCB have two pads like this. And the plunger, uh, which has this conductive side down, will come down on top of these two pads to to short them and thus generating a signal. I will show you more once we open the AVC80 how the keyboard works. So let's glue this. It's reasonably flat. And once again, I'm very new to working with spray on glue, so I don't know if I'm spraying from the right distance or if I should spray more or spray less, but I think it will be good. So now we just let it sit on dry for some time and see how it turns out. Okay, now this has dried and we have the conductive side here of the mylar and we have the foamy side here. So I will try to punch a few pads out of this and see how it goes. So I have this hole puncher, I have a hammer and I have a very cute cutting board. I really hope that my mom doesn't see this episode because she was the one who gave me this cutting board and I don't want her to see that I'm ruining it. So let's see how it goes. Well, I got a little pad out. And I think it's thick enough. And it's definitely dense enough. So I think this is gonna work. Let's make a bunch more. So, now I have a whole bunch here for testing purpose. So I'm going to take the old uh, foam pads out of these plungers and try to apply these new ones and see how it works. And I'm also going to uh, try to apply those that I got off eBay to see the difference in height. So, uh, here I have the old 
plungers with a little mylar brick and a foam pad and there is a little plastic disc under it as well so Ethan carefully put in a tiny little screwdriver in here I should be able to lift the little plastic disc out and this entire assembly will basically come out uh, if I could just get hold of the little disc hmm, I'm gonna try another one maybe this one works better yeah here it has started to lift already so this is how it looks without anything and here is a little assembly and you see it's just falling apart and this was the problem so here we have the mylar disc and here we have this little plastic disc that I need to reuse so I just need to clean this somehow and and glue a new one on top like and put it back. I think this will work. Yeah. So maybe I'll make three for testing. Let's see. And then I will make three with the other pads. And I will assemble them into the computer and see how it goes. And whatever is the best method, I will continue using that. So I have actually cleaned these three plastic discs here and it was quite easy uh, because the foam in these plungers have become so brittle so it's basically just falling off. I was just rinsing it in a bit of water and then rubbing it on a towel. However I make sure to put a rugged side up here before I spray on some glue because I want a rugged side to be against the foam so that the smooth side gets down into the plunger. So let's put some glue on it. Whoops, it's going all over the place. Oh, maybe I should try with another type of glue. Okay, I will just dip it here in the glue and see if that works out. Oh. Everything is drying. Okay, I will start with this one <laughs> because I can sense that it's starting to dry now and I will just assemble these two together like that. And then I will make this one like that. Whoops, maybe it needs a bit of glue. Ah, perfect. And the third one. Oh. I'm starting to have my doubts about this method. Uh, I think I'm gonna go with this ready-made adhesive things instead. But let's see. This is for science. Yeah, I think this turned out good. Uh, but this one became a bit too flat. The height is a little bit different on them. Well, I can see that this is not a consistent method. I will put them into the computer um, anyway, just to test them. But chances are that they are too compressed to actually make contact. Now let's prepare three of the other sort to see how that works out. For the second method, with the foam pads that I ordered off eBay, you need to reuse the little plastic discs as before. And you also need to reuse the mylar plates from the old plungers, because these ones just have two adhesive sides. They don't have any conductive mylar on their own. So as before, I want the rugged side to be towards the foam. So let's see if I just remove 
this how it becomes if I can remove it. This was more difficult than I anticipated. Come on, come on, come off. Ah, see. So let's put this down on here and make it centered like that. So we have a little plastic disc. Now I will try to put the mylar disc on the other side here. These were actually, ah, now it came off at the first try. You know what? This is so much more simple than making your own foam pads. But they are a bit taller, a bit higher, so I wonder if that will become a problem. Well, let's see, I will make two more of these and then we will compare the two methods. Mm. Mm. I hate these. And here's the last bit. Oh, oh. Well, not quite centered, but it will do. So, let's install these into the plungers. And let's install these homemade versions into the plungers. And then we can evaluate. So it should be just popping them in. Well, maybe I can push this little circle down. Ah, so it clicks like that. You can actually see these holders on the side here. Well, it might not show on the camera, but little plastic disc should be below them. If you have your own Keytronic keyboard, you can open up and look because it's very difficult to show. So if you compare this to the original, you can see that the new ones are much taller. And I don't know if the original was like this when they were manufactured and they have just become compressed with time or if this is the wrong height. That's why I need to test it. To install the homemade versions that are much thinner, I just do the same thing. I just press this little plastic disc into place. And as you can see, this is pretty much the same height as the original. Only that, well, this doesn't fall off. So, come on camera, focus. Ah, so let's see if this works better or if they need to be this height. I will install two more of the homemade versions and then we test it. So, when you want to open your ABC-80, you just use a normal flathead screwdriver. And there are four screws to open it. Two on this side, here and here, and similar here and here. So, let's see if I can open it. I need a smaller screwdriver. And it just lifts off. Oh, 
Look at that. There is a screw here as well. Five screws, all in all. And it looks like this. And what is important to remember is how this keyboard connector is. One of the uh, cables is labeled N here. So I'll just try to remember which side it is. And to remove the entire keyboard, it's four Phillips screws here. I will start by removing these and then I remove the connector. And the keyboard just lifts off like this. Wonderful. On the back side of this keyboard assembly is a whole lot of tiny little screws that all needs to be removed. So we can remove this PCD and get to the mechanical bit of the keyboard. So let's start with that. And here we see the pads. So you see there is a slit between the pads and this is where the plungers come down and make the contact. So the idea behind the keyboard is that this conductive foil comes down, comes down here and make contact between these two and send a signal uh, that the key has been pressed. Let's set that aside for a bit. Here is the mechanical part of the keyboard and the plunger simply goes in here and they only fit one way. So do not worry child. Like that. A little push. Wonderful. Yeah. And then a spring comes on top here and a keyboard cap to keep it in the upper position so it doesn't fall down by gravity and make contact. So if I just take the spring and a keycap, any keycap would do, uh, just for demonstration purpose. It works like so. Now it's down. See, I'm pressing this. And this little foam pad comes down to make contact here. I have cleaned this board before with an uh, electronic cleaner just to remove any oxide layer. Uh, one problem with old keyboard is that if uh, an oxide layer is formed on these pads that means they don't make uh, proper contact with the foil. So uh, just use uh, you know electronic cleaner to remove the, um, the oxide layer. Uh, don't use any abrasive metals because you can damage the tracks here and that's really not good. Overall it's a pretty beautifully designed PCB. You can see it's probably not designed by a computer, by computer-aided design because these tracks are so 
flowing so smooth. So I guess someone has been drawing this by hand. This is a hand draw design. Cool. All right, uh, let's install some more of these uh, homemade and normal ones just to see how it works out. And I don't care much uh, about which keycaps I'm putting on right now because I'm just I just want to test the function of the keyboard with the plungers. I don't... Well, this is not the final assembly, so to speak. I'm just putting more of this here. Um, you know what? I will put the homemade ones in a row below this. So I can know what is what. So homemade ones here. And... The eBay ones here. And some springs and some old keycaps. Uh, I don't care which ones. Well, if I look carefully, I can see that the eBay ones are just flush with, with this mechanical... Come on, camera focus. They are just flush with this mechanical part, while the homemade ones are very much has sunk in. And they barely stick out when I press down. So my worry is that will these EVA ones, will they make contact when they shouldn't, when they are in the up position? And my other worry is these homemade ones, will they really make contact when they are pressed down or are they too much sunken in? I will just uh, assemble this really quickly and then we'll try it. I will not put all the screws in the entire way because it's too much work. I'll just put them in a bit of the way. I think like that is fine. Yeah, one in the middle. And it's fine. All right, uh, I didn't put all the screws in because ain't nobody got time for that. And as I said, I just want to try the function. So as you can see, I just put the keyboard up here and connected this keyboard connector again. I didn't bother to fasten it or put the lid on because anyway, I need to take this assembly out to make the rest of the keys. So let's switch it on and see what happens. So it says ABC80 there in the corner and no uh, letters are coming out. Uh, so that's good. 
uh, the plant chillers are not making contact when I'm not pressing the keys. They are staying out of contact. That's good. So let's try the top row here, which is the eBay ones. Well, yeah, they all work. And let's try the homemade ones. Oh no. Oh, I have to press much harder. Oh, this is not good. This one works. This one works. This one doesn't work every time. So that sorts it. I'm going to use the eBay ones. Uh, screw this homemade uh, thing. It, it's just more problem than it's worth. So as you can see, it's... Yeah, this one is making every time. This is just... I have to press three or four times before it registers the characters. That's no good. So, uh, the eBay ones, uh, it is. I will sit in front of the telly and uh, assemble these while watching some anime. See you later. Well... Only one left to assemble. After assembling so many of these, I <laughs> got hang of how to remove the protective side. Oh, boop. Yep, it's there. Just a little plastic disc left. See how I have sped up. And the plastic disc can be any side. Oh yeah, I also noticed, see how clear it is, if you use some detergent just for, you know, cleaning your dishes, you can get the old glue off uh, and they look very nice and shiny and clean. I did the same to this foil. So just a hint there. And so, and then... In it goes into this one and I just use a little tiny little flathead screwdriver to give it the last push like that and it's all assembled that's the last one I also learned another thing I uh, read up uh, a bit more about this keyboard and it turns out this doesn't have to be the conductive side because the keyboard the keyboard doesn't work like making contact uh, on the on the principle of making contact between these two halves it's actually a conductive keyboard so it's enough that some metallic material come down come on focus <laughs> come down on this uh, to change the capacity uh, capacitance uh, of this PCB. And what are all these done? Well, uh, there is a microcontroller that controls the scanning of all the columns or rows. Uh, I don't know which way it's scanning. There are some amplifiers here to amplify the signal when the capacitance change over these pads. And there are multiplexers here that work together with the microcontroller to send out signals to the rows and columns when it scans through them. And then there are some buffers uh, to store the data and uh, send an interrupt signal to the computer through here. So, as you can see, it's sitting very tightly now. I put all the screws in, 
So if I made a mistake, I have to take them all out again. I hope I didn't make one. Let's put it in and test it. And here I'm just gonna plug this in and test it. And if it works, I put it here permanently. First, let us try all the numbers. Yep, that works. Some special things that work. Error, um, yeah. So return key works. <laughs> Let's try holding in shift and see what the uh, uh, number row does. Yep, that works. And let's clear this and try the letters. That works. Yep. And next row. That works. Can I erase this? Yes, I can. This very cool and the last row and that works and and let's see caps lock does caps lock work on the LED uh, LED for caps lock turns on and all the letters come out big so that works and space bar works nice. Hmm, so the shift on the right side doesn't work. I'm holding down shift and huh, I should look into that. Let's see the right, uh, the left side, the shift works. Cool. Well, it turns out it was just a piece of foil that had been bent when I assemble this and now if I try the shift combination it works and shift on the other side works as well wonderful so since it's all working I can start assembling it And lastly, we put the lid on. Now I'm planning on repainting this lid, but I will just put it here for show and uh, I will bring it to the paint shop um, sometime. I'm not too stressed out uh, about finding new paint for this because I don't have any upcoming exhibitions where I'm planning to exhibit this machine, but it would be nice to have it back in the original color. And as I said in the previous video, this is not a machine that was casted in a specific color that then yellows uh, over time. It was actually casted in a very white color and then painted uh, in the factory. Uh, I'm worried about these logos. If I repaint the entire thing, I don't want the logos to disappear. But maybe if I find a, a color um, or hue that is similar I can just paint this missing areas and it will not be noticeable let's see that is uh, for another video so uh, I guess that was all for this time I don't want to make this video too long so I'm stopping here the last video became one hour and uh, I think that was too much uh, I'm planning on a series of videos actually that shows more of the software and how to program in BASIC using the ABC80 and especially the graphic capabilities that it, that it had. Uh, so uh, that will once again be for another video, more about the hardware in another video.
uh, don't forget, forget to like and subscribe and see you later.